Welcome to another episode of the Gay Archive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith, and our guest today is longtime Atlanta performer and choreographer, Mark Jones. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, Art. How are you? Good. Haven't seen you in quite a while. It has been a while, and we've been trying to get together here, and we're finally making that happen. It is, but I remember even from my first days in Atlanta, seeing you perform and being involved with the with the community, both as a, a dancer and a choreographer. So I'm sure you have plenty of great stories to tell. I have a lot of stories and a lot of years, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the first place we're going to talk about is a bar in Atlanta that you made an indelible impression on. You were their longest running choreographer, show director, uh, and that was the Sweet Gumhead, which our mutual friend, Martin Padgett, wrote a book about. In fact, it's on the bookshelf behind me. It's my coffee um, table. I'm sorry? It's on my coffee table. <laughs> um, so what was your experience coming into Sweet Gumhead for the first time? Oh, I, I was a total novice. Um, it, it all kind of happened like a fluke. Um, I had actually done a pot of do with another male um, who uh, arranged for us to guest star at the Sweet Gum Head. And at that time, I met all of the ladies, Charlie and Satan and Lisa King and Lady Sean and all those people were working there. And we just kind of became friends. And then um, Lisa King asked me to choreograph her talent number for the Miss Florida Female Impersonation Contest, which was a huge pageant. And um, so I did, and, and we did uh, Patti LaBelle, Music Is My Way of Life. And after that, when I came back to Atlanta, the uh, uh, Sweet Gum Head contacted me about being just the choreographer. Someone else was going to be the show director. And then within two weeks, that all changed. And they said, we're making you the show director and choreographer. And I had never directed a drag show ever. I, I totally did not know what I was doing. But um, I just approached it from my theater background and my dance background. And that is kind of what they were looking for because there were all these other show bars all over the city. Um, Roski Fernandez was across the street at the Hollywood Hots doing lavish, beautiful productions. And Tasha Wallace was uh, down at the Onyx and she was doing great productions. And so that was kind of the direction the show bars were going. And that's what this week I'm had wanted to do. So they brought me on board and I just kind of approached it like that. And it, that's where it all started. Now, the time frame we're talking about here is what, the late 70s, 79, 80? Mm -hmm, exactly. So what a lot of people, if they have not experienced that time frame, if they were not alive or not out in the bars at that time, uh, as Mark just mentioned, one of the things that was happening in the performance scene in the gay nightclubs was major production numbers in the drag shows. It was not one drag queen with some makeup and a wig on, lip syncing to a song. It was costumes themed after the original performance, multiple dancers on stage, uh, backdrops, male support dancers, all kinds of things going on. It was almost like going to a Broadway show. Exactly. And Sweet Gumhead, at the time, billed itself as the showplace of the South, and it was renowned for being one of the biggest and best uh, drag show places in the Southeast. So it was quite, quite a challenge for you to walk in there as a novice and suddenly be given the responsibility of kind of forming its image. Yeah, it, it, and, and I had some big shoes to fill. I mean, Rachel Wells, who had just be, uh, become Miss Gay America when I went to work there, uh, you know, had been the show director there and had done uh, just an outstanding job. And they had always done productions, but not uh, as focused on dance productions as what I did. But um, they did lots of wonderful productions and comedy things and all. And then, of course, Rachel won Miss America, so she was traveling. So that opened up that slot. But uh, yeah, it was it was quite something. I mean, we had rehearsals three, four, five days a week. We put in a new production every single uh, week. I'm always challenging myself to come up with other things. We did specials. I did the entire musical of Chicago, which won all kinds of awards. 
I uh, created an evening with Bette Midler starring Charlie Brown, and she won all kinds of awards. I did. Mark Rivers, who did the lighting and special effects, won awards. So it was just a beautiful time, and, and the shows were just fantastic. And fortunately, many of these people that you've mentioned uh, are still around, and I'm hoping to get them to share their stories as well. I know Mark Rivers is still active um, on Facebook talking about you know gay bar history and his memories. Uh, Charlie Brown, of course, is still around performing in Atlanta. Uh, John Greenwell um, is still around, Rachel Wells, living, um, I think, in farmland somewhere in the middle of nowhere. In Kentucky, yeah. In Kentucky, but um, he's still around. And I'm hoping one day he gets an uh, internet connection so we can actually do a video interview. But uh, a lot of these people are still around. And so you played a, a big part in the last years of Sweet Gumhead and how the shows went on. And what was it like as far as, you know, the type of people in the audience compared to later days of, of drag shows? When you, when you put on a show, did the audience behave differently? Were there different people in the audience than you tend to get now? Well, we had very, very loyal um, fans and customers that came every single week, you know, every single weekend. You could count on them in the same table sitting there. But then, you know, the, the bar was always packed on the weekends and especially. And, you know, people were just so loyal and they just loved uh, everybody. Um, the It was really a very, very high level time in drag at that time, pageants were huge. We would host the Miss Gay America pageant, which would be four nights of preliminaries at the Sweet Gum Head. And the final night would be like at the Fox Theater. And that's where Rachel Wells won Miss Gay America. Then the next year, Hot Chocolate, who worked for us, won Miss Gay America. Um, and that was at the World Congress Center. But these were huge pageants. You know, there was a representative from every state. so. 50, uh, you know, entertainers competing and they brought their game. And then, of course, the Miss Georgia pageant was held there and it was huge. And the Miss Atlanta pageant, all of these pageants grew out of all of the show stuff. And everybody was doing huge production numbers. And, and I was making a few bucks on the side choreographing these talent numbers, you know, for all these pageants. And it was just a wonderful time. We worked very hard. We weren't paid very well, I have to tell you. But we uh, really loved it and we formed a camaraderie that, you know, just would never, ever go away. Now, at that time, um, did Frank Powell still own the Sweet Gumhead? Um, no, he did not. He had already abandoned it and moved on. Right. Because he was kind of an icon and I, I think he must have owned about a dozen bars around Atlanta over some period of time. Yeah, I never really knew Frank. I knew him. Um, uh, Billy Jones, who was known as Phyllis Killer, used to have those Phyllis Killer Oscar Awards every right. year. And I met Frank several times at those because he and Billy were very good friends. But I never worked for Frank. So I know from reading Martin Padgett's book and talking to other people that Sweet Gumhead was known for attracting celebrities as well. Um, I think Burt Reynolds was one of the names that was mentioned that had been there. Did you ever see any celebrities in Sweet Gumhead coming to watch the shows? Oh, yeah. Paul Lynn came in. Um, Liberace came in in his big, long mink coat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> quite flamboyant, quite sweet. Just loved the show. It was very, very nice. Shirley Jones was appearing in town in a, in a play uh, for Theater of the Stars. She came in. Those uh, Karen Valentine, I remember meeting her, and Melissa Manchester. So it was a pretty popular place. And then in, in the early, um, I guess it was the early 80s, it kind of fizzled out. It started to go downhill. And what, how exactly did that come about? How did Sweet Gum Head end up closing? Well, none of us really know because we still had our good crowds on, on the weekend. Um, uh, just uh, the owners, I guess, decided to take on a, a partnership. Or I don't really know what went on, but it actually became a straight strip club. Uh, uh, you know, and we had a very elaborate weekend of closing shows and incredible. Everybody and their mama that ever performed at the Sweet Gum Head came back to do a number. And um, then we made it all about just our cast uh, for one of the nights. And that was very, very special. Uh, it was it was one of those occasions that you'll just never, never forget. So after the Sweet Gum Head closed, you decided not to hang up your dancing shoes 
and you moved on to the next venue that stole the tagline from Sweet Gumhead and called themselves the Showplace of the South. Mm-hmm. That was a place that was called Illusions, which was over on Peachtree Street near 11th, I believe. Yeah, it was the, uh, the corner of 10th and Peachtree. Now, how did that compare to you when you were leaving Sweet Gumhead and walked into Illusions? What were you, what were you thinking? Well, it, it was so wonderful because um, Ray Ferris, who owned Crazy Ray's, um, loved our shows. And he just didn't want that to die with the closing of the Sweet Gum Head. So he decided to open a show bar. And John Austin, who had been our manager, um, and I'm sure you've heard of John Austin. Oh, yeah. Wonderful John Austin had been our manager at the Sweet Gum Head. He was going to manage Illusions and help put this whole thing together. And so he contacted me immediately and say, said, we want you to direct and choreograph. So I came on board. We actually were holding rehearsals for our opening while they built the bar around us. Construction was going on. It, it was quite something. They, they put in the stage first, so we would have that. And then um, we had long weeks of rehearsals because I did some really elaborate productions. But it was the pinnacle of the, the show career for me, the, the illusions. I had carte blanche to the best entertainers. Um, Ray uh, just let me create and do and whatever I came up with, no matter how elaborate, he said yes to it. Um, Ted Binkley, who was also known as Dora DeVille, was our general manager there and was very receptive to anything we wanted to do. And John Austin, in addition to being the manager, was a fantastic set designer. So when I would come up with these productions, he would create sets. And then we had costume designers. Um, it, it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. I've, I've talked about illusions a little bit in some other interviews I've done. Um, probably most notably, my interview with Ted Binkley, mm-hmm. who, um, to give everybody a little bit of perspective, he was also involved in Crazy Rays. And as Mark said, he, he did drag as George DeVille. But in his, um, in his interview, he talks about his very first gay bar experience which was in 1952 in Atlanta, in Nashville, Tennessee. So 70 years ago, this mm-hmm. is a, a mature gentleman in the, um, in the bar and entertainment scene. And one of the comments that he made about Illusions was that it was a proper, respectful bar. And I remember from when I went there, I don't ever remember any fights breaking out. I don't remember people coming in looking like they were homeless or, you know, shabby. Everybody seemed to want to get dressed up a little bit. Everybody seemed to be, you know, minding their P's and Q's. It was, it was a very pleasant and slightly upscale experience right there in the middle of Midtown. Yes, um that's something I'm very, very proud of. We, I went even further than I did this week, I'm head, and we really treated that show like it were a Broadway show, uh, just happened to be using female impersonators. And so um, we were respected. We were invited to the Piedmont Arts Festival to open that gala in Piedmont Park, and we did my production of Dream Girls. And of course, you had the mayor and the governor and the city council and all those people there. And they welcomed us and it was quite an experience. And then when they would have um, this festival in Midtown that uh, that people went from bar to bar and business to business, we actually did shows that afternoon and that was open to everybody. Families came, children were in the audience. And I mean, I remember doing the best little whorehouse of Texas with all these children in the audience, but we were very well received and respected. And um, I think it's because our attitude was it, it was a show. It just was a show. It was a good show. It was like a Broadway show, a cabaret show. And um, I know over the years that I went there, I think almost every iconic Atlanta drag performer of that era performed there, as well as every uh, well-known male dancer. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I'm not mistaken, Ron Sanford worked there. Yes. Um, Tony DeSario worked there. Yeah, he was part of it. Douglas worked there. Mm -hmm. You worked there. I mean, they were all at some point up on stage. And then as far as the, the drag queens were concerned, um, there was, well, Charlie Brown, of course, was there. 
Um, you mentioned Dora Deville. I know I know Ted did a few shows there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Amber Richards. Yes. Um, um, I think Tina DeVore worked there. Mm-hmm. Um, Tiffany Middlesex. Pretty much everybody that did drag either in Atlanta or in the Southeast ended up performing on that stage at some point in time. Yeah, we had we had the cream of the crop. We had Sheena Black. Oh, yeah. Tiffany I, Area has come as, as guest star. We had Tiffany Middlesex join our cast, who I just adored working with. We had the fabulous Tasha Wallace, who uh-huh. um, always my favorite dance partner of all time, not to mention she was our costumer and beyond talented. Um, and then a crowd pleaser. They just loved her. We had Dawn Dupree. We had, um, you know, Brian Douglas, Tony DeSario, Bertha Buck. Oh, yeah. Saint Hill. I mean, we had a real cast. It was, it, there, there was, every single one of them were stars. But you know what? We When we did the group numbers and the productions, I always uh, spread it out and, and starred. I, I made Lily White dance. She said, I'm the only person that ever made her dance. But I would do a rock and roll type of production that would suit her, you know, and I could uh, choreograph it that way. So uh, every single one of them, I made Bertha dance. We did the hot lunch jam and Bertha danced and, and tore the house down. Can I tell you? It was wonderful. It was an incredible bar. It was just so much fun. And the performers, again, just like Sweet Gumhead, you know, there were productions. You mentioned John Austin doing the, the uh, sets for it. You had costuming, you had multiple people on stage at one time doing a show. It was just a, an incredible thing that we just haven't had in quite some time. It seems like over the last decades, drag has kind of devolved into a single person just holding a microphone or having on a Madonna headset and prancing around the stage lip syncing. So it's changed quite a bit from, for the most part, from what um, what y'all were doing then? Yeah, the, um, sadly, there just are no facilities, no big show bars like that. Um, it, it requires a lot. I understand that because you've got to pay these people good salaries if you want them to come to rehearsal four days a week and then come do two shows a night. There's no way you can take another job and do that. Right. Um, then, uh, you know set design and costuming and lighting and sound and all of that, you know, as I produce shows, it adds up really, really, really quick. So, um, you know, for a while I was away from all of that. I never was away from theater. I've continued to choreograph and perform, um, doing high school choreography for musicals and all that sort of stuff. But um, now that I'm kind of back in it a little, a little bit, I do see that it has changed, but there's a real thirst for those kind of shows again. And I just hope somebody picks up that mantra. So a little while ago, we mentioned some of these iconic drag queens that had performed at, um, at Illusions. And um, so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and mm-hmm. ask you to tell me your favorite drag queen story from an experience at Illusions. Oh my gosh, you are putting me on the spot here. Let me think, what is my favorite drag queen experience hmm there's so many um let me think back to this you know the sweet gum head was was quite something okay so when we brought tiffany ariagas on um as a cast member at the sweet gum head she had just become miss florida and of course was just very highly sought after and in demand and um so It was always a challenge when you hired someone new because typically in that day, those same girls, you know, Donna Summer was the rage. So they all were fighting to do the Donna Summer numbers and the Patti LaBelle numbers and, you know, all the the big numbers of the day. And so when Tiffany came, her, uh, she was known for her Donna Summer, but Lisa King, who was in our show and just loved, beloved in Atlanta, had already kind of established herself doing those numbers. So, um, we had to have a little back to Jesus meeting one day about all of that. And it did get all resolved. They worked it out beautifully. Um, but so what we ended up doing is starring Lisa in a, in a Donna Summer production that I did of Bad Girls and a Hot Stuff. And then Tiffany would come out later in the show sometime and do Last Dance or one of those numbers. So uh, it, it worked out. 
But, you know, there could always be a little uh, tension there when those sort of things happen. Now, that was Tiffany Ariagas, not Tiffany Middlesex, right? Yeah, uh, Tiffany Ariagas, yeah. Yeah, because Tiffany Middlesex also won Miss Florida in the early 80s, I believe. Yes, she did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember seeing her perform down at the Copa, which is another story entirely. Exactly. So I love working with Tiffany. She, you know... She, she understood me, number one, because she had been a show director and choreographer, so she knew what that was all about. And when they brought her, uh, were bringing her, you know, there was all this buzz that they were bringing her to replace me, and um, and none of that was true. You know, um, I had already met with the owners and everything. And I, no, um, Ted Binkley actually had been very good friends for many years with Tiffany Middlesex, and um, he always wanted her to come be in the show. And she decided she wanted to give it a shot. And we clicked from day one. I loved working with her. So funny in the dressing room. So talented on stage. Uh, could just do any production. Would even help choreograph some things. It was just a dream to work with her. Yeah, I, I've known Tiffany for many, many years. Um, I now live in Tampa, which is where she lived until she passed right. away last year. And um, I had talked to her numerous times about doing an interview and she always said well let me get to feeling a little better or you know I, i'll try mm -hmm. to work it in and it never happened but uh, i certainly have very many fond memories of tiffany and i can still see her doing her tina turner and patty labelle numbers and see her hand outstretched all five fingers stretched out vibrating to the music mm -hmm. she was quite an active uh, performer. She did kind of gymnastic routines in, in the middle of her show. She was very, very entertaining. Yeah. And if you ever saw her 42nd Street production that she choreographed and she won Miss Florida, none, nothing like it. It was just the best. And she was, was pretty amazing. So why you, how long were you at Illusion? Were you there for the whole run of the, of the bar? I was. So you worked with every one of the guys that danced on stage there. That's oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite? Well, I would. I don't have a favorite because uh, the the boys have a real camaraderie because, you know, we are the backup. <laughs> so right. uh, but even though we have our solo spots, you know, the girls are the stars. Right. But uh, we had a real camaraderie. But um, I, there's so many. I absolutely loved working with Gerald Daniels, a consummate professional and just a sweetheart. I loved it. The Sweet Gum Head, R.C. Cola and Dean Turner. Dean was just a mischievous, gorgeous little thing to work with. And I loved him. Uh, you know, I uh, had uh, Chip Ballou, who was uh, uh, just a natural born dancer. And I had to like calm him down and train him to do choreography as opposed to his own thing. And that I loved and he loved it. And we still talk to this day and he always talks about that. Um, so I have to say all of them were just fantastic that I worked with. But those those stand out in my mind. Tony, of course, was extraordinary. He could learn any step in one second that you taught him. And of course, he had this beautiful singing voice and he was gorgeous to look at. So he was a dream to work <laughs> at. And then my wonderful Brian Douglas, who we're still friends to this day. You know, he started out as Leslie in the show doing drag. I did and not he, know that. Yes, and he, uh, we brought him in from Tennessee, and he was absolutely beautiful as Leslie. But he just came to me one day and said, I don't want to do drag anymore, but I still would like to be in the show. So I talked to him, and I said, you understand it's a transition, you know, and um, you you may not get the attention that you did get. Well, boy, was I wrong, because he's so gorgeous as uh -huh. a man. I remember and him well. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, he's a sweetheart too. And I remember, I just loved working with him and we're still friends. He came to see me last year at one of my stores. I, I've always had a weak spot for blondes anyway. So oh, yeah. well, he, he was, was kind of always my favorite because a lot of the other dancers there at Illusions were dark hair. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of a little bit of a standout. He was. Now, speaking of turning the tables, is my memory playing tricks on me or do I remember Lauren Michaels working there as a male backup dancer before the Lauren Michaels character came out? Mm, that might have been at Levitas. It wasn't at Illusions. Okay. 
Because mm-hmm. I thought I remembered my uh, Michael was, I believe his name, uh, dancing as a male dancer before Lauren Michaels came out and made her he, big splash on the market. He may have, but I never worked with Lauren. So what about um, Amber Richard? She's another crowd favorite from Atlanta. What was she like to work with? I loved Amber and we were really good friends. She was such a perfectionist in everything she did, how she looked, the nails perfect, the makeup perfect, the hair perfect, the clothes impeccable, pressed, clean, you know, just everything she did. Um, Talented, uh, funny as all get out, had this gorgeous look about her, but then that could MC and total trash mouth, you know. So it was quite a dichotomy between the two. But um, I just adored her. And when she passed away, I, I've never gotten over that to this day. Just gone too soon. She was Atlanta's very own Jessica Rabbit before Jessica Rabbit existed. Yes, she I was. Mean, she was that kind of tall, buxom, redhead with that kind of sexy attitude and amazing. And she also served a mean plate of enchiladas over <laughs> San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but those were some crazy days in Atlanta. There's some incredible performers out there. Um, you know, many of them are now gone. I remember um, I interviewed Raven a while back, and Raven told me that Amber was so sweet and so helpful, and kind of like one of the mentors that Raven had. Um, in designing, co- you know, designing her costumes and and her performances on stage, and basically, she said that Amber told her, um, "You can't overdo it. Too much is never enough. Mm. If you're going to put rhinestones on your gown, put them all the way down the back, on the sides, underneath, everywhere anybody might possibly see during your number, so that it has that flash factor all the time." And of course, as we all know, Raven turned out to be quite a showgirl herself. So. Mm-hmm. Costumes, yeah. Yeah, those costumes and the fire act and the gymnastics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you had all this this uh, experience working in the what I will call the classic drag scene in Atlanta from the late 70s into what, the 90s? Is that when uh, Illusions closed? Yeah, the, uh, about, I think 1989, 90 it closed, yeah. So you had this this nice period of you know, really elaborate drag. What happened after that? Well, you know, it when we didn't close because we had lost our audience. They were going to, I believe, increase the rent, or I, I don't know if I had that totally right. Ted could tell you what happened. But anyway, Ray bought some property and decided to build his own illusions building. And it was off a of, uh, off of Dutch Valley Way, I believe, oh. off of my drive or whatever. But of course, you the way as I understood it at the time you in order to get your liquor license the building had to be physically built before you applied for that liquor license and all of that and they wouldn't give him the liquor license and that was the end of it and it was very very sad we had some it was going to be fantastic I was going to be able to have a stage that had a lift that came out of the floor and a ramp where I could drive onto the stage i mean he was gonna do it upright and so disappointing it didn't happen that would have made quite the impression because i still remember and i'm sure you were there because you were everywhere in the atlanta uh (laughs) gay entertainment scene but when charles pierce performed for hotlanta river expo one year and came in he drove on the stage in a um i believe it was like a 73 pontiac convertible uh, right up on stage, and the crowd went crazy. So imagine mm-hmm. if your local uh, drag bar had that opportunity and could bring up, you know. Oh yeah, it would have been it would have been incredible. We were we were going to do it up right, but it just didn't happen. So after illusions closed, you kind of took a hiatus from the from the uh, drag and choreography scene, and flat. You know, fast forward to 2022 and you are now doing something that not very many people in the country are doing you're kind of bringing back that golden age of drag to atlanta by doing these kind of pop-up shows once what is it once a month or so once every couple months yeah Mm -hmm. once a month 
at this brand new space called Guaki Marbis, and you're calling it Stars of Atlanta. How did that happen? It happened uh, out of out of sad times, actually. Um, you know, we had a lot of losses, um, and we lost Lily White last year, and Regina Sims, and we lost Tina DeVore. And for all three of those, they contacted me to put the shows, the memorial shows together for them and directed an MC. And I did. And of course, we brought back all these wonderful entertainers. I mean, from everywhere. We, we had uh, Tommy Ross come and Tasha Long and Tiffany Ariagas and all these people come for Tina's show and, um, and the same for Lily's show. And so out of that people would they even though they were there to celebrate the lives of these fa fabulous entertainers they so enjoyed the show and the old school drag and the total glamour everybody bought their a game the most fabulous gowns and costumes you've ever laid your eyes on and it just brought back such memories to everybody and people kept saying you should do this you should do this again we miss this we miss this so out of people keep you know, asking me that, um, I contacted several venues, and when I contacted Guacamarguez, immediately they said, yes, um, we'd love for you to do it. So we call it Stars of Atlanta, A Night of Legends. And um, I guess I'm a legend, which really means I'm old. But <laughs> I'm not sure I like when people say you're an icon. But anyway, I guess I am. But uh, so we've, we've had great response and, and people have loved it. And we, we're just doing it once a month. Um, we have another one coming up the, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, November the 26th. It's at eight o'clock. And then we have a beautiful Christmas show planned for December the 17th. And our whole goal is to make people remember, have those memories from the past. And, and the songs that we choose are, are like that. The costuming, the way I format the show is very much how I used to format it in the past. Um, it's, a, it's class, it's sass, it's pure entertainment, and it's laughter, a few tears. It's just wonderful. And I noticed from the pictures I've seen and the pictures I'm putting up in the course of this interview that you are not one to be upstaged by a drag queen in a heavily beaded gown. <laughs> now why do you say that art <laughs> well we'll let the audience decide for themselves but they're going to see some pictures of you in some some pretty outlandish uh outfits even as mc even if you're not actually up there you know doing a number you tend to dress like a showman yeah i believe you know what do i say everything's better with a sequin or a rhinestone on it so <laughs> <laughs> I kind of have to agree with you on that. I have been known to wear some pretty extravagant outfits, you know, pants that look like disco balls and mm -hmm. all kinds of strange things that that people uh, kind of do a double take and they're like, what? But hey, yeah. that's what it's about when you're out there on stage. Yeah, I know what I like. I just kind of pick things and, and I encourage the, the girls in the show I know what I like to see when I go see a show and I want to see beautiful costumes and things that I just can't see anywhere else, you know, right. that's, that's just kind of how I pattern that. Well, that's kind of what I, what I was alluding to earlier when I said that, you know, before there were such big productions on every level and now that seems to have gone away a little bit. You don't see quite as much of that except maybe at a pageant. And I don't know why they don't bring more of that back because so many of the of the performers that I've seen lately, the new performers, just kind of all fall into the same, you know, kind of vanilla mix. You don't know who is who because they don't express the personalities the way they did before. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, well, I, and I'm not really familiar with a lot of the new entertainers, so I don't know I'm qualified to comment on that. But but I will tell you what has been so positive for me is that when, as we do these shows and as I did the memorial shows, very young uh, guys have, and people, not just guys, have come up to me that are in their 20s. And, and of course, they don't know me from Adam, you know. But they're like, you are fantastic. This show is fantastic. We need more of that. We've never seen anything like that. And I thought, well, that's really encouraging that, you know, that, you know, maybe a show like we used to do could actually, maybe somebody would open a show bar and it could actually be a really big success. 
to a whole new generation, not to mention the old timers that would come to the early show. So, you know. I think that's kind of a, a, a good question. I don't know whether that would happen or not. I think part of the problem with uh, show bars is that they require so much expense to build out the space and make it look glamorous and put in the sets for the shows and all that kind of thing that you really have to draw a crowd almost every night to be able to keep everything going. And unfortunately, you know, back in the day when you were at Sweet Gum Head and Illusion, uh, Illusions, I was going out, you know, eight, nine, 10 days a week. I mm -hmm. mean, it didn't matter if it was Tuesday or Thursday or whatever day it was, you went out because that was the only place that you could meet other people that were gay, that you could socialize with them, you could talk to friends, you could pick up a date for the night, whatever it was that your goal was, that's where you had to do it because we didn't do it in public and we didn't have Facebook and Twitter and, and Grindr. Right. So I think you'd almost have to have a bar that had a uh, show bar as a part of it, kind of like Rocky Margie's does with that back room where you open it on the weekends and do a show and then during the week, it's something completely different. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. Because um, to sustain it and, and to be able to make the cost, a show is is it costly to do. And it's costly for the performers. I mean, the costuming alone costs yeah. them a lot. And then, of course, if you do drag, you've got makeup and, and wigs and shoes and jewelry. And I mean, I, I look at some of their costumes and I'm like, I know what we're paying you and I I don't know how you're doing, <laughs> you know, but tips, people are very generous with tips. Let me say that. Are you dipping into a trust fund somewhere? <laughs> do, you have, do you have a daddy? <laughs> I know. Exactly. Because if, it, if it's quite, I mean, they're, they're as fabulous as what you would see in Las Vegas. Yeah. These costs. They are. And I, I've been really impressed. I'm so glad to see that, you know, your show, the concept of your show, um, it's just great to get some of these entertainers that probably wouldn't be, you know, necessarily performing every week at the local uh, gay bar, but that are legends from the past that have had decades of experience and that come out and, and show, you know, the younger crowd and whoever else wants to show up what the shows were like and, and how talented our drag queens were from 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yes. And, you know, we're, we're just having fun, you, you know, and I, I, that was the highest compliment I, I got actually the, all these straight women I work with have come to the shows and they have never had never seen a drag show before. And um, they loved it from the moment we opened the opening number. They said, Oh my God, it's, it's so professional. It's so fun. It looks like you all are having a ball. And, and that, comes across to the audience and i think that is a really high compliment it absolutely is and i am so happy that you're doing this even though i'm not in atlanta to see it right now but just the fact that you're out there doing this and showing the world that it can be successful and that it's a lot of fun and bringing these people back from you know like i said 20 years ago 30 years ago and bringing them back to life on stage and letting them show show off their talents is just incredible. And I'm so glad that uh, Guaki Margis has embraced that concept and is is working with you to do that every month. Yeah, they've been great to work with. And and let me say, I, even though it's not as elaborate, of course, as the illusions used to be, I do try to do like an opening little production and a closing and we do some set design and, you know, some lighting effects. And we do try to make it a show like it used to be, even though it's a smaller scale. We, that's what we're trying to do. And we need more of that in our lives. Yeah. So that obviously is a part time uh, hobby almost for you. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it takes quite a bit of time. Uh, but on your day to day life, you're doing something else that is as creative and possibly as extravagant as some of the drag routines that you've put together over the decades. Um, you're an interior designer in Atlanta. Yes, so I am interior designer uh, and the marketing director spokesperson for a chain of stores. There's three of them. It's called Southern Comforts Consignment. We sell upscale consignment furniture and new furniture. And I put the stores together. I do their marketing. Uh, I do all of their promotional videos that we do every single week. And then I do these events. 
Um, I'm known as uh, and trademarked as Mark Jones, the consigner's designer. And um, I've already done two Christmas events. I do another one on November the 19th at our Alpharetta store. And that's like our grand finale. And these have grown over the years. I've been doing them for five years that I've been there. And they have grown to be events, let me tell you. And we have a ball. I mix my show business. I wear the outlandish coats that you see on stage. I wear them. They wait to see what I'm going to walk out in. And which is fun. And then I I do like these tablescapes or a room or whatever. And then um, I always make them sing with me. And then I do another final song. So I mix show business and interior design. And it's really worked. Wow. Now, you mentioned there are three stores. One of them obviously is an Alpharetta. Where are the other two? Dunwoody and Roswell. Okay. So we're all kind of on the northern suburbish side of Atlanta. Mm hmm. Where a lot of the money is. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, when you do these these um, vignettes in your stores, do you break a lot of rules? Do you make them up, like head turners so people walking by don't just say, "Oh, that looks like Mary's living room." Are you actually putting some some kind of spice and pizzazz in there to really get people to look twice and think, "Oh, wow, I never would have thought to do that." Now, what do you think, Art? (laughs) I think you probably just go to the Rooms to Go catalog. Uh, No. (laughs) No, I do have to think on the spot because I never know what is coming in uh, or what's going to be greeting me when I walk in the door. Uh, So I have to think on the spot and I have to direct my warehouse guys where to put what and do this. And my assistant and I go back and decorate and, and do this. But I always like to think outside of the box. Yeah. I'm and and sure of that. people take notice too, because it, it isn't what, like you said, it doesn't look like Aunt Jane's house, you know? Right. And a lot of times that's all it takes for somebody to notice something. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, look at all the rage there was, whatever, 15, 20 years ago, when some restaurants started making their, their little um, dinner rolls in small um, clay pots. And everybody's like, oh, I didn't know you could bake in a clay pot. Mm-hmm. And that became a thing all of a sudden. And it's the same thing with furniture. If you put something in an unusual place or use it for something different or mix it with something that you don't think of normally putting it with, it changes their perspective and kind of opens their mind into, you know, other possibilities. Yeah. I always tell my my clients, too, because th- there's a big, you know, misconception about designers when you go to your their house that they're going to you're going to throw everything out and start over, you know, with all new. And I tell them, look. I probably will use most of what you have. It probably will not be in a room you've ever had it in before because I'm going to like repurpose it somewhere else or in some different way. But, um, I, you know, that's just being frugal, number one, for the customer. And then, of course, you can add new and you can always paint and reupholster and all those things. But, um, you know, I just like repurposing things, I, I think, and giving it a new use it for something you never used it for, you know, before. Right. And it also keeps some of the character of the of the client in the house, because exactly. obviously they picked out that sofa or that lamp or whatever it is that you're repurposing. And their friends will walk into the house and, and realize that that is part of you know their friend's design. It's not, you know, somebody from Hollywood came in and threw all chrome and acrylic furniture everywhere and said, OK, we're done now. Mm-hmm. You know, it maintains their character and their personality. Yeah. And that is what makes a house a home is those personal touches, the the personal photos, the the piece of furniture that you inherited from your grandmother or your mother. And, you know, I have those pieces in my home. Are they pieces that I would have probably bought? No, but um, they have such a special place in my heart that I have to make them work. I know exactly what you mean. Um, Decades ago, when I was still living in Atlanta, I had a design business there that was called Three Beekman Place, which, as you can imagine, was a very eclectic and um, unusual design concept at the time. Three Beekman Place, of course, is Auntie Mame's address in New York. Mm -hmm. And every time you see her apartment in the movie, it's completely redecorated in a different theme and style. So that was my main design business. But then I jokingly created business cards for a second design business and a little portfolio. And I called it formula design because so much of Atlanta at the time 
was these suburban housewives who had no creativity. And I would have like choice. You would pick one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. So mm -hmm. column A would be, you know, Chippendale, Queen Anne, or, you know, something. And you would pick which choice you want. Then column B would be, do you want emerald green, you know, royal blue or burgundy as the as the main color? Because so many people in there at that time were just like their houses all looked the same. They mm -hmm. had big framed pictures of magnolias on the wall and, you know, oval Queen Anne coffee tables, which never existed in the reign of Queen Anne. You know, she didn't know what a coffee table was. Right. But, uh, <laughs> they had somehow embraced this concept of um of standardized design and so i love it when somebody like you comes along and pulls in other elements and freshens it up and gives it a little bit of um uh, of panache and flair so you know i'm glad you're you're doing that and getting to express your creative juices in another way besides just on stage with the performers yeah i've always done it people said when did you start designing honestly as a kid i used to drag my mother's furniture around and <laughs> the room she'd come home and they'd be redone I just and I just see it you know I can walk in a space and I can just see how it should be laid out and done and I even though I did go to um, the Atlanta School of Fashion and Design and study interior design I have to say most of it is just just comes to me just naturally well you're doing a great job and we certainly appreciate all the effort you've put into the Atlanta entertainment community and the gay bar scene, your work with um, Sweet Gumhead, with Illusions, and now with Glocky Martinis. So I really appreciate you telling us about those and taking the time to you know, do this interview so we can preserve these memories for other people who have never seen them or don't even know anything about Atlanta's history. So thank you so much, Mark. Well, thank you, Art, for having this whole forum. There's no one else doing what you do. And it is important, I think. Um, and uh, we have so little in the history archives that doing this is really, really special to me. Thank you. That's why I started this. It seemed like the bar scene was neglected and everybody wanted to commemorate everybody who ever marched in a protest parade or went to jail for sodomy or whatever. But the bar scene, which was such a big part of our community, Nobody seemed to care about preserving it. And so here I am. And the fact is, back in the 80s, as you know, it was the bars that got us through, that survived through the, through the height of the AIDS crisis. I remember every single night, uh, and this is why Charlie Brown has such a special place in my heart. Every single night we were off, we were doing benefits somewhere to raise money to help. Because at the time, you know, we had a government that wouldn't even utter the word AIDS. Absolutely. And we were helping our own. And um, although it was the worst of times, sometimes it was the best of times, too, because we really saw the best in our community. That concludes another episode of the Gay Bar Archive show. For more information about this episode or to find more episodes, visit GayBarchives.com.